I got just so distracted by the video, I forgot to unmute. So we're happy to have Jim with us today. Um, uh, he's the president of, uh, well, I'll, I'll, let me start first by saying this, that I, uh, I did a little homework. I looked at some of uh, some, some online videos and I liked one very much where he was starting a speech that, uh, with a banner that said, investing in mines, not missiles, reducing the threat of nuclear war. And I said, boy, it seems like that's so appropriate. Not only is a mine a terrible thing to waste, but an entire planet is too. So my second thought was um, after seeing sort of his multiple efforts uh, in the peace movement, which are, you know, um, in our introduction, um, that, um, you know, he probably ought to deserve an award. I watched Biden um, uh, give a, you know, Medal of Honor to a soldier uh, who was very, uh, you know, just going back into battle and just, just what, you know, and uh, if there was something like that uh, for people who, you know, continue to advocate for peace, you know, Jim might be a recipient. So, um, Jim is, um, <clears throat> he's been an organizer and activist for like, like 50 years um, on the front lines. He's uh, uh, serves as national president of Peace Action, vice president that is, president of Peace Action New York State and a statewide vice president of Citizen Action of New York. Um, he's a board member of Campaign for Disarmament and Common Security and advisor for to reverse the trend. It's a program to, um, you know, for the, of the Nuclear Peace Foundation. And I'll let him uh, talk more about himself and share what he okay. has. Okay. Thanks for being well, with thank us, Jim. Hey, it's a pleasure. And thank you, Steve. And thank you all. And um, to all this, uh, hey. and by the way, get his book. African Americans against the bomb, uh, and you'll be able to get a thorough education on not only what he wrote, but uh, inspiration too. Well, uh, you heard a little bit about me. I'm uh, born and raised in Buffalo, New York, um, at a time that was very static. In fact, I like to say that uh, the times were very troubling. And so by the time I hit 1968, which I became eligible to be able to go in the military, not necessarily looking to go, it was a time that um, they were still doing draft. I didn't want to wait for the draft. What had happened in my city, as you remember, um, in 1967, uh, Dr. King, on November 9th, 1967, Dr. King was in Buffalo, and he had been brought here by the Graduate Students Association and um, of U University of Buffalo. And when he came, I can recall many of the letters to the editor, comments on radio, uh, some liking, many didn't. In other words, it was a time where, as we call people of color, black people, uh, we were still referring to them as Negroes. And also, as you heard Vincent mention, even before that time, before that, uh, the words that Truman used was still being utilized by many as well. Well, in 1968, two weeks after Dr. King got killed, he came, he came to us in, in November 9th, 1967. Now remember his trail because it was in uh, March of 67, Dr. King was in California and many have cited that that's where he gave his uh, first official Vietnam anti-war kind of conversation. And as he moved across, coming uh, back across the states, he was going to be in New York. He was going to be in New York for a couple of days. He was going to participate in a rally, uh, but he was also going to be at the meeting at Riverside Church on that April 4th, 1967. And it was there where many people in this intersectionality of the social justice movement and the peace movement can really be tapped into. Because it was at Riverside that he made the connection. When he spoke at Riverside, remember he was not only organizing and leading 
what was known as the poor people's campaign back then, but he understood and he was already himself first in how much harm war was doing. In other words, he had an understanding about the importance of humanity living in peace with one another. And he also had an understanding about the monies that governments waste on war toys to fight each other rather than to the development of the people in their countries. And when he spoke and suddenly there was another groundswell. So many of the black organizations of the day didn't support him on it. In fact, in Vincent's book, he talks about it. And if you go Google or anything, you will find that the NAACP was one of the groups that pushed back. Now, was the NAACP bad? No. The thing about them was that you have to remember the culture. Culture, very racist, very sexist, materialism, and the N-word still being used. I don't think that that's a real inclusionary culture. And it wasn't. Part of it was the Democratic Party or leadership at that time, which as you know, uh, many Blacks were supported of the Democratic leadership. I mean, remember Lyndon Baines Johnson was in office. And him and uh, Dr. King were pretty, were at least on the same side when it came to civil rights. But Lyndon didn't like the fact that Dr. King was speaking down on Vietnam. And so that unleashed uh, the J. Edgar Hoover to begin to do his little tricks and tracking on Dr. King and others. Well, for me, in 1968, right after his death, I walk around the city of Buffalo wondering, what do I as a person of color have to do that I care about this country as much as anybody else? As I walked around, I wind up at a, a recruiting office, went into every branch, listened to what they had to say, and wind up enlisting in the Marine Corps. Now, it wasn't a great desire. Remember, I mentioned that I didn't want to wait for the draft because some of the folks that were growing up with me, uh, I saw them going into certain branches and I felt like if they'll take them, I don't want to be there because you kind of know as you're growing up, you see how some people carry themselves. You kind of like, I don't think I want to go the long distance with them. I wind up enlisting in the Marine Corps because of the subliminal effect within the culture. The culture was very militarized then. And this is what we have to pay attention to even now. The militarization then, here's how it came across. All the comic books, I won't say all of them had Archie, but Sergeant Rock and all the rest of them were in the comic books. Where kids play with Transformers today, I was playing with army men, cowboys and Indians. And in fact, it was a time when plenty of Westerns were on TV. The militarization was in Hollywood. Every movie you see, you see uh, that this played out in a very warm way, you know, at war, come back, fall in love. You know, they just made it so uh, easy to take in. It was also a time with great ignorance in the culture. If you already have poor education being provided to folks, then uh, with the N-word still running around and civil rights had not yet been obtained fully, don't think for one moment the schools were teaching anything other than the miseducation that has been around for far too long. So we didn't understand what it meant to go in the military. All the newspapers had, you know, when they talked about what was happening in Vietnam, they would talk about in negative terms. I don't know if you have heard the term like gook and always refer to them in a way that wasn't humane. And with that, it makes you, it makes it easy for citizens to think that they're bad people. In fact, the government will basically 
make the North Vietnamese seem like they were horrible people. And we here did no, I did not know anything about war. I did not know anything about foreign policy. But now that I'm in the Marine Corps, that was two weeks after Dr. King. I arrived to Vietnam on December 2nd of 1968 after being put through to become a machine gunner. And Vietnam is when my world really began to change. Because as I was going into boot camp down in South Carolina and being prepped so I can go to the war, the civil rights movement was going on, or better yet, it had started being converted to the Black Power Movement. You had the weathermen and other actions on the campus. You had the anti-war movement. You even had your drug culture evolving at that time. So it was like a very pivot point on some key factors that play right now. Well, I get to Vietnam. And my understanding of who the villain was certainly changed. As I began to interact with the indigenous people there and hear and learn, and because of the movement that was going on in the US, that was sort of like a lifeline. Because with them speaking, I had another mindset. See, in boot camp, it's all about mind control and get you convinced to follow order, uh, really pull you deep into the belly of the beast. Well, I made it through Vietnam, thank goodness. Um, I am now listed as a combat disabled veteran. Uh, got this, but I always tell people if I lost, had lost a limb or anything, I would still think that I would be on a trajectory that keeps me aligned with supporting humanity to work towards making it work for all of us. When I got back home from Vietnam, I was sent back down to North Carolina. Still, remember now, this is still a very racial dynamic going on with all of the action going on. And while I was there, I would wind up doing a lot of their civil defense uh, training and, and uh, I guess, holding the line because on many, many alternating weekends, they would have me in Washington uh, when they had troops, when, you know, they would send up for backup to fill the streets, you know, and to hold back the crowds. And which was interesting because on one, on those weekends on duty, I'm on one side, but when I have leave on my own, I'm on the side that's pushing for change. In fact, I used to swoop up to Washington from North Carolina just to participate in the action and to keep learning. It was also the time when the hunger movement was starting to develop. I, and I dare say even the green movement. I remember living in hostels, um, or I should say not necessarily living there, but living there while in Washington. And everything that we're doing now that we think is in harmony with the planet and good for people, we're starting to cook. The only thing that hadn't changed was the behavior of the government. And the other thing that hadn't changed was the consciousness of the, of the people about what the government was doing. Well, we didn't have the technology we have now. We didn't even get the information that people can get now. At that time, I mean, let's face it, it the world was quite ignorant. I mean, young people, weren't being able to tap into certain information. And young people were on lockdown. It was a very strict culture, not beating, well, for some, but it was strict in that you didn't get the same kind of information that adults got. And they didn't talk to you about it. And most of our adults didn't know what was going on because they were trying to survive. It was a challenging time, but I can tell you I'm a survivor and it brought me forward. So after doing a little bit of that and finally getting orders to join the Sixth Fleet in the Mediterranean do war maneuvers, it expanded my world more. I began, I visited all the countries in the Mediterranean, more talking with the people and learning even more. And that's the key 
about how we resist. Because people can't do what they don't know. Like if I had known prior of what the military was about and the things that were going on, hmm, I probably wouldn't have took the route I took. Even at that time, as they were having safe houses in places, um, I can't say in the US, but since I'm just down the road from Canada, people would talk about going to Canada. Yeah, <laughs> I'm a young black man, no employment in a, in a culture that is still very racist. I could barely walk down the street and I'm gonna go somewhere else resisting the draft. I think not. I did not have any assistance in the community talking about resisting it. In fact, in my community, what they said when I came out of high school, they said, if you weren't already being accepted into college, and if you didn't already have a job, they would say, go into the military to make something of yourself. It can help you. That, their perception was that there was something good and wonderful you could gain about the military. Problem one, they hadn't read Sammy Davis. Yes, I can book. Anyway, you should check that out. But the idea of going in there sounded feasible. And I, I kind of rationally in my mind think part of it was because you go into many Black families. And often you'll see a picture of someone in the military sitting up on that mantle and stuff, and they are endeared. And, it, and it's nurtured in the family. Oh, that's Uncle Bob. That's granddad so-and-so. Don't know what they did. Just know he was in the military sitting there with that hat on. And they feel proud about it. Don't know what he did. And it's stuff like that, that even now, that makes me, when people say to me, thank you for your service. I'm like, what are you thanking me for? Not to insult him, but really, what are you thanking me for? If you knew what I had to do over there, you would either be mad at me or the ones who sent me, but you don't know. So why are you saying, thank me? That's part of the militarization of the culture that got you thinking. It all centered around having a military being tough and muscle, toxic masculinity is what many are recognizing today. Cuts across color lines, age lines, and it hasn't been totally removed. We're in the midst of tearing down that, some of that stuff now. Well, when you add the fact that having traveled around the world, what I saw was other places, communities just like ours, where we're, that we're pushing back on statesmanship politicians and greedy corporates who were running the day. And, it, and as the voices who spoke against militarization and against all this wasting of money were continuing to speak, that's where my first learning, and I should say deeper learning continued. And I know you, you can't do what you don't know. So as you learn, you have to do it. And that's what I did. When I finally got out of the Marine Corps, I stayed, I lived in New York City stayed there until 1993 when I came back to Buffalo. In New York City, I'm one of the founding organizers along with Reverend Herbert Daughtry and G2Y Uzi in the forming of the National Black United Front, which by the way, is mentioned in Vincent's book about the big rally that many people talk about, which occurred June 12th, 1982 in New York City while Reagan was president against the whole nuclear stuff. Well, you would have thought that, all right, they're getting it, they're coming together. Well, 1982 is a long way from 1967 when Dr. King said something. And in 1982, we still not had yet merged uh, the activity of activist groups together for real, for real. We knew of each other's existence, but that march was a, 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 a prime example because we in the Black United Front, I'm getting ready to say fought our way in. We did because the Black United Front was coming with a whole different mindset that, was, that understood what we have to do. And so in some places who, that were not ready to receive us, we had 
to kind of like be very adamant. And we got in, we didn't get everything we want, but we, the role that we played was very important. And since 1982, when I look back and think about what Dr. King said in 1967, I don't see the effort being put in by the different issue areas to make the change that we need at this moment. And we're just now getting there. But I'm not mad because it, you have to develop the, the cadre who could push the narrative and who will be long suffering and laboring to get it, move it forward. And here we are. Right now we have uh, 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 this intersectional moment that requires us to, to connect the dots on all the issue areas and particularly between the social justice movement and the peace movement. We've been siloed too long and still siloed because we still haven't learned how to really engage each other as much as we should. Being back here now and looking at what is needed now, I am so thankful because the great wave of young people who are coming forward, uh, we should not be surprised and we should not act like we taught them everything that they learned, no. They're the bearers of the new skill, the new knowledge, the new energy, and they definitely are the ones who become the main occupiers of running the world for us. And we have to begin the transition. Everybody's talking about infrastructure. The infrastructure needs to be changed and so forth. I agree, and it is some of it. But what we have to look at is the infrastructure of organization have to change too. Because these young people who are coming on into the ranks are not coming to carry out an old plan. They're coming with a new vision for a better plan. And here's why. They've heard the stories of their grandparents. They're seeing the challenges and struggle of their parents. And they look and they say, no, we don't want that. And the world they want is not here yet, it's further. So that is a clear sight as to why you see them pushing hard now and getting in on all it and being part of this action on the front line and doing it in a way that upsets some people, but is what is needed and it is now and we need to be part of that. And when, when we talk about militarization right now here, right now we face it, you can't watch a sports game, you can barely go in a store without this false narrative of like military, making it so grand, like that's the way forward. And people in their ignorance not knowing what the military is doing abroad at whose bequest, those wayward politicians and those greedy corporates, not the individual, the hooks that they use, like come in the military, get, we'll give you an education. And yeah, they can give you a skill, but we also know that it's a slippery slope. They'll teach you a skill while using you to do something that is not so good. And the inhumane activity we see happening around the world that our military is involved in, that's about the militarization that has crafted people and think it's okay. And we haven't become perceptible enough to deal with it. Let me give you an example. Sorry about that. That, let me give you an example. The example is a uh, big, I know I have to get off quickly. Um, somebody just signaled me when I'm going too long. Anyway, here's what we're looking at. With all the sexual stuff that's going on, with all the drug stuff that's going on, and with all this, this world moving to everything, now it's a lottery ticket. Got, you, you know, uh, to take a chance, gambling. The military pushes for three main vices that play out later back home here in our community. It is the drugging and drinking. You look at every military movie, the romantic ones and everything. What do they do? Drink. They may not show the drugs of that time, but we know that happened. Look at the fallout from Vietnam. And you can't dismiss all the other wars with the morphine and all of that prostitution and pornography. When all these vessels and military men are abroad going in these other countries, when they're going in those countries in between the war maneuvers, look, 
they're not going in those countries for a sightseeing tour. What do you see? Again, look in the movies, where they wind up. Most of them are just in a red light district where you see all the MPs. You rarely see a military movie where it's that, not that drinking and that partying. And subliminally, that gets into people. And remember, in many of those countries where uh, prostitution is legal and young 18 year old impressional males going over into this country and being urged on by old hoots who have been around in the decade where there was so much not really good stuff to be doing urging them on pick up habits and bring them back here and they and they play out the gambling i mentioned uh the drinking uh, the prostitution the drinking these things are playing out right now and it's not healthy for us. So here, here's what all of this for me comes to. We got that and we still got the racial dynamics to deal with, which is why Vincent had, didn't have to, but glad he did write his book. And like even now, we in the peace movement. When we look around and we, and what do most groups say? We need more young people and more people of color. Well, they've been here all the time. Perhaps rather than saying we need them, we should ask the question, why aren't they here? What didn't we do? In fact, don't even ask what you didn't do. Ask what you did and you'll find out what we didn't do. It's really simple. To get young people or to get people of color, it's just like fishing for trout. If you want to catch trout, you have to go where the trout are. If you want to catch salmon, you go where the salmon are. I'm saying, along with getting us able to do the work, what we have to do is now challenge ourselves and forgive ourselves so that we can become better instruments for peace by dealing with what I dare say some don't want to look at, how they did walk bys and did nothing. Because as I talk about how things were, a large part of the peace movement comes from that generation. And I bear witness in 1982, it was there. And we're only now getting to a point where we talk about Black Lives Matter. And many of the slogans that we see around the country become uh, more like slogans without any action. Now is the time for action. And I just want to say what Massachusetts Peace is doing, uh, Peace Action is doing, is huge. Many groups are not going to have, uh, I dare I'd say, opportunity for this type of discussion. Oh, they want a speaker, but they're not going to have, they're not going to give opportunity, and, and there are a lot of reasons why. But I think that is what we have to begin to look at. How do we deal with those who have been left out, and what do we need to do together? Because back in 67, when Dr. King, um, um, uh, I mean, main, main peace action, y'all. I'm sorry, I said Massachusetts. <laughs> uh, back in 67, when Dr. King was speaking, nobody wanted him to say the things he was saying. Black community didn't, and certainly uh, the higher ups didn't want it. But look what was going on. Part of the reason that the NAACP did not support what Dr. King was doing was because of the relationship that Black communities had with the Democratic leadership. And, and don't think that Democratic leadership stepped back and didn't say nothing when they saw Dr. King talking about what could wreck Lyndon Johnson's legacy. Then the machine went to work on trying to split people off. And that is why they didn't go with Dr. King, because the power forces within the Democratic forces were basically saying, hey, look, you know, we've been with you. They work who they could get to stand with them, probably transfer some money and stuff. Not accusing nobody, but I'm just saying, you know how power works. And they don't, you know, and so they didn't stand with Dr. King. But we know now what Dr. King knew then and we have now to do what we didn't do then, and that is to cut the military budget, to increase 
uh, the disarming of the world and change this whole militarization kind of focus. It's all about being tough and threatening. We're hearing that in tons of books who are telling the stories about so many presidents who have threatened other countries unbeknownst to us and then tell us the other countries are the villain. We got a lot to catch up with and learn and about how our so-called leadership has been doing because we're in a moment of change. This is a new decade. And uh, as Amanda Gorman would say, the hill we climb, we can do it. We can get to where we want to get the world to if we work on it and if we work on it together. We do better together. And I look forward to a little Q&A. So I'm going to stop right there. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Jim. Wonderful. I think everyone's either clapping or putting in a mm, thank a you on their screen. Um, <laughs> So we certainly wanted uh, the opportunity for some questions. And uh, Lily, if it's okay with you, we might just roll over five minutes into the, the noon hour to uh, allow the time to do that. We had the uh, illusion of maybe doing it through the chat, but because the group is, uh, is small today and uh, we could probably just, just go around. And if uh, you do have a question, maybe you can use the reaction or raise your hand through some fashion to, uh, to go ahead and prompt uh, the next. Does anyone have one uh, off the bat? Um, and I certainly have something I'd like to ask you, Jim, at some point, but who would like to begin? Um, I have a little uh, a thought, uh, Jim. I, when I was looking at your background, I believe you have some, uh, uh, some experience in policing as well, is that correct? Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. And uh, when I came back from Vietnam and was living in New York City, I wind up, you know, everybody was looking for a job. <laughs> and so I filled out everything I could do, uh, civil service. And I got, got called to the New York City Police Department. Uh, at the, while I was still in the academy, they, New York was losing money. And so they had to cut a lot of programs and a lot of programs were some of the activity that they were engaging in was shifted over to something, um, I think it was called CERT. It was a special, it was a um, um, special monies that were being used to provide because the, I think the, the budget of the state and the city was kind of in lockdown. Well, uh, anyway, when I got out of the academy, I was stationed at the 79th precinct and, and it was there um, that my, I should say, my resistance to anything or anybody that would harm people just for the sake of it occurred when one day I was on duty that night and um, in the station house, me and the lieutenant, and um, uh, one of our couple of officers had picked up a gentleman and anyway, one of the officers wind up assaulting the person while they were in handcuffs and did, I mean, grave bodily harm. Well, of course I couldn't stand there and look at it. I mean, in the, in the uh, police academy, they had told us when we see certain incidents, don't get involved. <laughs> I couldn't, I couldn't swallow it. I heard it in the academy. You know, and it came me, yeah, but I knew I, I couldn't do with that. And mind you, remember, all these movements are going on. In New York City, there were a bunch of brutality situations going on. And the work on the, on the Black United Front then, before we went national, was dealing with all these brutality cases. So here I was, deep in this part of the belly of the beast, but also in the streets with my community. And... One day, somebody took a picture of me, uh, one of the local papers, community papers, and someone cut the picture out and put a bullseye on it um, because I was challenging our department and I was going to be a witness against the other officers. At, and even though they conspired together to write a different story, I refused to give in. So at, I'd say at five years, I walked off. To this very day, people say, you should... You should see, if you might have a pension. I'm not thinking about anything, but I knew two things. I'm not Superman. And I know that the threats that they were making and to friends of mine, it, 
it agitated me because I hadn't long been back from Vietnam. So I'm already aggressive from that kind of training. But I walked off and continued doing organizing with the Black United Front because we were pushing all these cases. In fact, when I walked off, we went on to eventually where myself, Calvin Butts, and a few other leaders flew into Washington with Rango, Congressman Rango, to meet with uh, at that at that time out of Michigan, uh, Conyers, Congressman Conyers, to get him to bring congressional hearings in New York City about police brutality. This is in 1980, the beginning of the 80s. And, and, and to this day, you can look on the c congressional records and see what we said there. But that, and when we look at today, we're still dealing with the same thing. Uh, I just, you know, I, I actually think the creator for the past he's taken me through. Because I needed to go by to get the insight of what the po how the police department operates, what kind of mentality, the challenges to change. And yeah, so that was my New York City experience around that. I worked in Wall Street too, did seven and a half years in <clears throat> dealing with stocks. But uh, you know, those were environments that, hey, they were a job. I, I liked everybody, everybody liked me. I'll never forget the day when we had the big ticket tape parade in New York City for Vietnam veterans. Nobody other than personnel, my coworkers didn't know I was a combat veteran. And when I came in with my little fruit salad on, because we were doing the march and where my office was in Wall Street, they were shocked. But at the same time, they, <laughs> they were amazed because the three years prior before that, that march, they, we have been endearing each other. So it, it just shows something about breaking through sometimes mindsets or pre thoughts that people have. Relationships can help make change, but also um, one has to be willing to step out. And so I was stepping now, I, you know, in the Marine Corps, I felt like I was a leader even before the Marine Corps. And I felt like that in every job I do. And uh, yeah. That was long. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Um, thank you. Um, I mentioned that because, um, as as I mentioned, I, when I was introducing you and, and Dr. Antoni, I, I kind of I, I placed myself in the context of the of the of, the, of uh, some of his uh, research inside my mother's womb, and mm. looking through her eyes as a black female, seeing people who were advocating for racial justice as well as and you know advocating against war being gunned down. Uh, the p place of a black male also is really interesting, particularly, you know what I, my, the reason I asked you that, and I'll be brief, is that the, the main historical thing I take away from black soldiers is that they went across abroad to so-called fight for peace, but then they didn't have peace at home. So I thought your background as a police officer was really engaging a whole nother segment of this discussion. And I think that, you know, uh, the, 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 the fact that, I mean, what you're watching now and with the videos we're seeing now that have come out uh, about people getting with, with the abuse that you, you, sell, you said yourself you couldn't be complicit with, that's just, well, I'll just say that's a really interesting, we should continue that whole line of discussion thought because it's sort of a, it may be a little bit Afrocentric, but we really know it's way beyond that. Um, we know it it's really broader is. than that. And, um, <clears throat> It's the, part the, uh, of the militarization, you know, of the culture. Because yes. other than people wanting to go and get a good job, what's the other factor about being a police? You can carry a gun. Mm -hmm. And in that toxic, heavy culture with army, cowboy, and that I'm tough, it's playing out. Hey, you know, who, who represented it a uh, somewhat legal way to, to use your prowess? The police department. And, and it's, and it's um, you have to be careful because it's a slippery slope. The police department is like the military and other, any, any institution that is not being so humane in the way that they deliver their services uh, can draw you in. And some people get in there and they get 
mute. Some people get in there and turn the other way. And some people act like they never saw anything. And yet we have all the courage of the ills that have been done by the military as well as the police. And we're still kind of, huh? which is why when I mentioned about the need for us to look at what we didn't do and start to, to kind of heal ourselves, I'm talking about the warriors. When I shouldn't use that term. I'm talking about the peace activists. Because it's easy to say, yeah, I hear people all the time, uh, I shouldn't say all the time, but too many times, where people say, yeah, you know, I've been in the peace movement uh, all these years. The two ways I hear it when they talk to young people, they play off the years. I've been around so and so, so and so. I tell my young people, how do you feel when people tell you about how long they've been around? Because being around is only attendance. I tell them, next time somebody tell you that, and people who say that should be clear when they talk about how long they've been around and who you're talking to, because it's a way you can do it and bragging, yeah, well, I've been here. But they never finish the sentence. The finish of the sentence is, yeah, I've been here a long time, all the time, but I ain't done nothing. I tell young people that next time somebody tell you that and it wounds your spirit because it's another way of putting young people down. Well, you're young. They're the parents of the new knowledge. They're the ones who's studying. They're the ones bringing the, <clears throat> that keeps us moving. We don't need to safeguard the ignorance and the lack of information we didn't have. We need to come forward. That militarization that goes on subliminally, both in the military and the police department, and particularly when you're talking about intersection, guys coming out of the military want to go into the police department. What are they coming out of with? They're not coming out deprogrammed. They're coming out in a state of I'm tough, to be authoritative, going into policing. Well, if you use the old historical kind of framework of the policing where they beat everybody up, whether, whether it's Stonewall or, or whether it's Blacks or for whatever reason, uh, we don't want that. I just, it's, it. so in other words, we got to continue to do the work to change the infrastructure of the country, but of, of organizations, including the police and the military. And it also connects with the money. We had today the same thing we had with Dr. King, Reverend Barber, Poor People's March, uh, organizing that's going on. For the same reason, the monies that the poor people need is already in the Pentagon budget. We got statesmanship politicians who are trying to play it off all off around COVID. Here in New York, Senator Schumer, one of the biggest obstacles for people in the peace movement, because he's always practicing excuse theology why he can't do or where he's at or his office, you know, he's hard to get hold to and, and get to stand on something. With, with that going on, what does that tell us? We have to change the infrastructure of our organizations, like I said. That means we got young people who are prepared to run for office, we gotta support them. Those who are in office, it's time to change the crew. It's sort of like, I used to say to people, I don't believe in rocking the boat, but I believe in changing the crew. You see, there's nothing wrong with the boat. If you get a crew in there that's rowing the right way, you'll get to your destination. We haven't been looking. We've been allowing politicians to slide off in this moment about COVID, like, oh yeah, we're going, how great they're doing to get us some COVID funds and, 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 and uh, the American Act. Rescue American Act. Yeah, we should have that. But you know what? None of them talk about how much of the people's money is in the war machine industry and in the, in the industrial complex that is feeding and growing war. They don't talk about that. They don't talk about, they don't talk about when Senator Sanders called for a 10% cut of the Pentagon budget. They came at the 11th hour like they was winning. That's only to give the image because they saw in the streets there a lot of people supporting Senator Sanders, but they didn't act as champion to get it across. We got another chance coming up now with Senator Warren's bill, I believe, that's out there calling for cut. But 
that's that things are changing fast and they must too many people have lost their lives at home and abroad in the world it's already here everything we deal with whether you deal with climate no you can't have clean fix uh, uh even though you get the policies you can't fix one side of the world around climate and you know you got that's a whole world thing and even if we had good policies and stuff here as long as our military is running amok overseas testing these just terrible terrible weapons and as well as that uh green gas emissions not only that, we talk about health care when they're testing in these places. Look what the Marshall Islands did when they filed their lawsuit, even though the U.S. and everybody pushed back against it. I'm just saying the, this is the worldwide struggle. It is a international social justice movement for peace and justice. We had the slogans. You remember what I said? People say, uh, um, no justice, no peace. We say peace demands action. And that's what we have to move people beyond the slogan into action. And, and we'll pick up the steam. We're climbing the hill, just as Amanda said. But we're going towards a just redemption around the world. Our footprint from here in America is everywhere. We talk about housing. We talk about gentrification overtaking our community. Well, we in the peace movement need to frame to others and get them to understand that, you know what militarized gentrification look like? It looks like the US over in those countries trying to put bases where they don't want them. Displacing people, changing culture and bringing in a whole flurry of other not too healthy things. Even now, even while we're trying to deal with the necessities of getting ourselves back together, what do we have those in leadership doing but trying to create another moment for war? Who are they pointing at? They point at China, they point at Iran, they point at North Korea. Well, <laughs> um, we've seen that movie before. The question is, is what will we the people do? The people can't do what they don't know. So we in the peace movement, we gotta connect those dots. And we can't wait for the climate movement or housing mm -hmm. to figure out how we connect. We have to go to them and show them. Once people get to tune and, and the understanding, then you'll see some collective movement together. There's still some siloism going on. I would dare say that the powers that be wanted to be that way. You know, people like to talk about mm -hmm intersectional moment, but they don't act it. Thank you, Jim. I mean, I did, you're a fountain of youth I can drink from all day, I think. Out um, <laughs> of a courtesy uh, for, for Lily's time. And, and yeah, yeah, yeah that, home team. So uh, y'all can have me back anytime. Thank you for having me. And uh, well, well, Jim, we have, we've got one comment actually from, from Rosie <clears throat> Paul here who just wanted to, uh, to say something and then we'll segue into Lily. But thank you so much for your time and, and your insights. I mean, all of your <clears throat> resonate with thank us. You. We appreciate you greatly. So Rosalie? Yeah, am I audible? Please. Yes. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Unmuted, I hoped it worked. Oh, I just want to say thank you, Jim. Honest to goodness, um, when you said toxic masculinity at the early part of your talk, I thought, yes, I hear you. <laughs> um, how wonderful to say it right out like that. And clearly we value toxic masculinity and we push for more of it. The big guys in the business suits and the polite language are still being toxic. They're yep. still going for all the wrong things. And I yep. wonder, aren't they just a bunch of adolescent boys? And why do we allow ourselves to be led by such people? Anyway, um, I <laughs> want to just say thank you for touching on just about every aspect of all that troubles us. And uh, you just did great. And I want to thank everybody here too for, um, <laughs> you know, even when you were having your little technical glitches early on, it was a nice thing. You were all calm about it. And it was for me a chance to get to know Devin a little bit and Brenton a little bit and Stephen a little bit and Martha I already know. 
and I look forward to meeting Lily. Anyway, um, it's just uh, been a lovely thing. So technology Thank you. doesn't always work and that's a good thing to remember too. Thank you, Jim. Thank yeah. you so much. And mm -hmm. I'll be glad to come to any, I don't have to be a speaker at your meeting, but invite me to just your meeting to sit in like everybody else and I would love to do so. Good.